It has been a long time since I was able to say this. The division leading Raiders. Oh, yeah. In a uh, an interesting twist of fate here, as you can see my Raider hat. With Kansas City losing their opener, the Raiders going into Denver and squeaking out a win, and Miami hanging on and beating San Diego, there is only one team in the AFC West that has a win, and it is the 1-0, and I almost said Oakland, Las Vegas Raiders, with the other three teams all losing. I don't expect this to last, folks, but I'm going to enjoy it. But the... The gods of football are not exactly fair. They gave me that this week, but they didn't give me fantasy. I'm in two leagues. And you guys, we were in uh, you know a little fantasy league. We did a little Nation one a couple a couple years ago. I really didn't you know want to win because you know I don't want to hear it. But I hadn't done fantasy for a long time, and this year you know one of my relatives said, "Oh, let's do it," you know. So I split a team with my son, and you know we went and did a live draft, the whole deal. And then also, I'm in a hobby league. You know, we're gonna have to start making some content about this league because it's all hobby people. Um, and Commissioner Dave Marino, who you guys all know, the Hobby Social, of course, he put it together. Interesting draft, lots of fun. That league, I'm not worried about. That league, I'm gonna take first place. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to win week one and probably win every week because that's how I roll. But the the league with my son, which I got to tell you, is it's less money. It's not as, you know, it's not as, uh, it wasn't as costly as the uh, Marino league. Typical, you know, Marino's got fancy taste. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to win that one, or at least I want to not be miserable because it's my son's first experience in fantasy. He drafted the team. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be honest with you guys. And this isn't a fantasy episode, I promise. But I, I want to start off with it because here it is Monday and I know nobody cares. And I'll tell you what I need. And by the time you listen to this, you'll probably know whether or not I got it. it it's not going to happen. But the interesting part about it is this. We had the third pick in a standard 12-team PPR league. And I convinced my son to take Austin Eckler, who had a good game. You know, had a, a couple of nice catches had a bunch of rushing yards, you know, had uh, a touchdown, you know, a very, very stellar game. But Ian, at the number three pick, wanted to take someone else. And I talked him out of it saying it's a long season and that, you know, there aren't a lot of stud running backs and that we could get wide receivers, you know, um, in the draft. And we did. But he wanted to take Tyreek Hill. And had we taken Tyreek Hill, we probably would have won week one. And, and, and week one looks like we're going to lose now. I'll tell you what. We were basically even. We had two players left, and the play, the person we were playing against had one. In the Giants game last night, he had Tony Pollard. And Tony Pollard went off and had uh, a 20-something point game with two touchdowns and just a, a, a great all-around performance. I thought we'd still win because we had Graham Gano who was the giant kicker. And, you know, he's probably going to get some field goals and some extra points. And, you know, maybe we get 10 points out of him and, and be within, you know, be within reach with tonight's game. We will have one player left. Of course, Graham Gano missed, had a field goal block and missed another field goal and ended up with zero points. So I'm now down by 25 points and we have Garrett Wilson going tonight. It is a PPR league. You know, if Wilson goes out there and has 10 catches for 100 yards and a touchdown, we would squeak by with a win, which I guess is possible. Not a league with bonuses, like, you know, if you get to 100, you get five points or anything like that. It's just, you know, straight points. I think the, um, you know, the probability counter going into the Saturday night game, it was a 50-50 toss-up. Um, and now I think we have a 12% chance of win. So you're saying there's a chance. Anyway, so if you listen to this, you know, throw on Monday Night Football, get out your Garrett Wilson jersey, and let's go, Garrett Wilson. Give me some points. Give me some stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll sneak out a win. But I'm excited for at least one week. I got the uh, I got the Raider hat on. I'm excited about the Raiders, a little Raider victory. Now, I don't know how many of those we're going to see. Jimmy G looked good. The one difference that I saw with this team, as opposed to many, many years past, is they got the ball 
with the lead, one point lead with five minutes left. The last five years, this team would not have been able to kill the clock for five minutes. They would not have been able to hold on to the ball. They would have maybe got one first down and would have punted it. And whoever they were playing against would march down the field, kick a field goal, and beat them. They were able to kill the last five minutes and change off the clock. That's Garoppolo. That's actually Jess Jacobs' great blocking. Um, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed week one football. There's nothing like football. Um, it, 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 it coincided with, I believe, the Dallas show. There had to be a lot of football trading going on, a lot of you know fun cards and whatnot. Um, I, I was going to do a PSA return reveal on my um, on the show today, but that's not really exactly the most fair thing for the folks listening to audio. And I have like three audio listeners for every one video listener. <laughs> so um, right now, most of the folks still listen on audio, which is pretty awesome. So I didn't want to do that with like a reveal and say, look at this, look at this. I had, you know, 102 card PSA sub where I got four or five tens and just a bunch of threes, fours, fives. I wanted to show them pretty terrible, but I'm not going to do that. Maybe that's something for another day or a live or like an Instagram quick video or something like that. People like to see that, but I am going to do that because people want to, you know, talk about cards. People want to see cards. It brings me to my topic of the day, right? Um, I, I love the feedback I got from last week's Friday episode. Um, you know, a couple people weren't happy that I did a two minute episode instead of 30 minutes that I was copping out and lazy, but everybody basically thought it was funny. So that's good. People enjoyed it. Um, try to make light of the situation. But that said, I'm not trying to gloss over it. I'm not trying to make light of it so that people look the other way. Right. It is a very serious situation for many, many reasons. Right. And, by the same token, while I shouldn't gloss over it and ignore it and not give it its time, I also don't love that it is all people are talking about, right? It is, it, it can't be nothing, but it also can't be everything, right? Because the hobby's in an interesting spot, right? Hobby's in an interesting spot where previously you didn't have to sell the hobby. Like it was everywhere, right? And I think the goal is for people to stay in the hobby, for people to join the hobby, to get more people in the hobby. I'm sure that's the goal of, of the manufacturers, I'm sure it's the goal of the companies, I'm sure it's the goal of, of you know hobby companies. Yeah, there are collectors who will probably say that's not their goal, but ultimately even the collectors are better off when more people are in, more people are in is more money, the value of their cards go up, the manufacturers are, are you know competing for more dollars and therefore being more innovative with their products and the collectors get better products because of it. Um, you know, things like, you know, refractors, the finest refractor set and, you know, numbered cards and autographs and all that stuff that all came out of the last boom. It all came out of, you know, a bunch of companies coming in and competing for hobby dollars. Um, you know, high end cards, you know, when LeBron came in, people were making, you know, I mean, exquisite for, you know, for his first bunch of years. Right. So, um, you know, when people are in cards, it's usually better for the collectors too. So even you collectors out there who are saying, I don't, I don't, I want to pay nothing for my cards. I don't want more people. I want less people. Even you should understand that, you know, more people in the hobby, more money being spent in the hobby is, is even good for you, the collector, because you have, you know, better stuff to choose from to collect. Um, and there are folks out there who, you know, who, who will disagree. Um, I'll tell you, man, you know, even you, the loudest complainer, you wouldn't have got your prism monopoly to open and enjoy if not for the masses that have come in in this last run-up so you know be smart about it so anyway it leads me to you know where we are i don't know whether or not a constant news cycle of scam 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 um is really something that puts the best foot forward for the hobby um and all the back and forth that comes with it and all the, you know, the, the conspiracy theory you named. So I was trying to make light of it with my episode. Um, but it, it, I mean, it's a difficult line to tow, right? Because you also, if you're bringing new people in, you do want to educate them on the space, right? You do want to let them know about, you know, the scams, the fraud, the, you name it, that, that, you know, that do happen. Um, and they have happened. They've happened for the longest time. Um, I have a book. I think I had like three or four copies of this book. Um, I've given it to listeners. It's called The Card. And it's about, you know, the the Honus Wagner card and, you know, the potential trimming of that card, the original one being hand cut and the whole deal. And, you know, it's just 
if you were to type in like you know card crazy card stories i mean the honus wagner alone has a million stories with it right from that first you know instance to you know people stealing it from the the you know hard rock cafe or planet hollywood i forget which one it was you know uh, charlie sheen owned one and you know the fbi got involved it's a whole deal you know to to uh, there's just so many stories so you can't gloss over it but the hobby's always had it um so forgive me if you thought that my uh my my brief episode was kind of making light and trying to push it to the side um that was not it it was you know look if you're anything like me, you come to this hobby, you make this content, you collect cards, you buy cards, you know, you 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 get on on Instagram and you message people because this is an escape from the other stuff. Um, I record this. It's 9/11. You turn the TV on or you go into the city where I work, and you know, my train today was filled with, you know, just firefighters and police officers and folks going to the 9/11 site and. You know, I come home and I want to record an episode and escape from the daily drama, the daily craziness, and escape from you know the the stresses of life. Uh, and that is what makes this hobby awesome. At least it's a hobby that's been there for me for a long time. And there are days and weeks where the escape is sometimes worse than what I'm trying to escape from, and that's never a good thing. Um, I know I'm not alone in that. A lot of people have expressed that to me also that, you know, it's drama, drama, drama. And I guess that leads me to the headline, right? Hobby your own way and don't look back. Not just don't look back. Don't look sideways either. The don't look back's easy, right? Because that's don't regret some decisions you've made. If you're buying cards that you enjoy, you're doing it your way, you know, you want to switch it up, switch it up. You know, don't don't dwell on the, the you know the, the the stuff that you bought that might not have panned out, or the stuff that you were buying because you thought you loved it, and you don't love it anymore, and you've moved on from it. Just do your thing. You know, kind of put blinders on. And then I guess the flip side to that is forgetting about you know no regrets and look, looking to the side, right? It, you're running a race here, right? That's what you're doing. And anybody who's run a race, not me. Look at me. I don't run. I don't run for anybody. You, somebody's got to be chasing me with a weapon to get me to run. But there are people who run. There are horses that run. They put blinders on them, you know? They tell you don't look side to side. Don't just run your race. Run your race. So if I had a piece of advice to give to folks in the hobby, it would be run your own race. Now, let me flesh this out a little bit. Hobby content people. You know, you're new into this. You're trying to find your own space. I can't tell you how many messages I get from people who are starting podcasts, who are making content. I get a lot. Um, and, you know, they ask, like, yeah, what's with the longevity? How are you able to do it? How are you able to, and here, here's the biggie, how are you able to deal with all of the negative commentary you get? You know, this person saying, why should I listen to you? Do you even collect? You know, or people telling me my content's fake or blah, blah, blah. I'm getting these messages all the time. And I, I Obviously, I'm, I'm a little more eloquent with it on DM, but the sum and substance of what I tell them is put on your blinders and run your own race. Forget about who's in the lane next to you. Forget about who's in that lane. Forget about what kind of content that person is doing and do your own thing. That's the only way I think you're going to succeed anyway. It's the only way I think people will find you authentic. Um, and if you fake it because you're trying to be like the person in this lane or you're trying to be like the person in this lane, eventually you're going to get found out anyway, right? Because you can't fake it forever. You just can't. You People will figure you out. People will realize that you were not being authentic. You were trying to copy or imitate this person or that person. And even worse, from a content perspective and a collection perspective, you shouldn't care what this guy's doing. You shouldn't care what that guy's doing. And if this person over here wants to invest in young quarterbacks because that person thinks that's what they're going to do, and you think that's foolish, great. Great. You think it's foolish. Then don't do it. You run your race. You buy what you want to buy, right? And if you want to share what you're buying, great. You want to be a collector and tell people this is what you're collecting? You want to show off your cards? Great. You don't have to go the extra step of showing your cards, telling people what you're doing, telling people why what you think what you, you think you, what you're doing is the right way to go. You don't need the extra step of Oh, and what this guy in this lane is doing is stupid, right? You can make your own money without worrying about what's in somebody else's pocket, right? That famous philosopher, Jay-Z, who I quote often. 
what you eat don't make me shit. Very good advice here. This is good stuff. Let somebody else do what they're going to do. Let you do what you're doing. You should hobby your own way. And I think that little fun lesson there will grow the hobby. Because there is no wrong way of doing it. I'm guilty of this myself, guys. And, and I think that's another important thing for us all to kind of move forward, right? You have to understand your own faults and your own flaws. And, you know, one for me is I, I 100%, I 100% throw some stones here and there. Um, and I probably shouldn't do it. Um, breaking is one of those areas that I should just let people do. I sh you want to do it, go ahead and do it. Every once in a while I say it doesn't make sense. It's sort of like a casino and blah, blah, blah. But breaking has its benefits. And it's I believe it is what is going to bring the most people in. I really, truly believe that. Now, my hope is that there's value in those breaks because bringing someone in and keeping someone here are two very different things. Think about that. If you get somebody to join, somebody to spend their own money in something, you still got to provide value for them. You still got to be able to, you know, give them what they got, get something. Now, it doesn't have to mean, it doesn't mean everybody who gets in a break has to make money. That is not what I'm saying, right? But you leave a Broadway show after spending, you know, a thousand bucks for your family to go and sit in nice seats and have some drinks and get there and have a dinner and a whole deal. You at least want to feel entertained. You want to feel like you got value from it. It's the same kind of thing here. The product's got to be good. The product on Broadway show is what you're watching, what you're hearing, the songs being sung, the acting, um, the product. And look, we saw premiere patches on NFL jerseys this week. We see Patrick Mahomes coming out with his own stuff. We see, you know, the MLB debuts. Um, I'm excited for Bowman Chrome coming out this week. I'm going to hunt for that Babe Ruth refractor, you know, the first Bowman. I'm going to hunt for those SSPs. I'm looking for, you know, the Johnny Bench autos. I'm looking for the cool stuff that's in there that we haven't seen in, in a while. I like the innovation because people are trying something different. I may even get in some breaks, you know, buy a player, buy a team, maybe buy some Yankees at a discount because nobody wants the Yankees because even their good player, Jason Dominguez, managed to get injured. Uh, <laughs> so I guess, you know, really where I'm going with it, guys, is um, do your thing. Let everybody else do theirs. Um, have fun. Use the hobby as your own escape. Use the hobby as, you know, what you want it to be. And if you see somebody doing something, you know, different than you, but still doing their own thing and having fun, don't shit on it. You know? Now, that doesn't go for the frauds. Obviously, call out the frauds. Call out the craziness. There's value even in what I made fun of and called the tin foil hat stuff. Um, I just think sometimes they stick with it, you know. Sometimes there's stuff there. There's stuff to chew, right? There's stuff to make a video about or two videos. Once you make 11 videos about the same issue, it's sort of overkill, especially when everybody else is doing the same stuff. I believe that pushes it a little too far and pushes people away. But that's just me. I'll never tell anybody what they can and can't do. Everybody can go out and make their own content just like everybody can go collect. Last little nugget, if you've stayed with me. I have a thought about breaking. And if you're with me here 20 minutes in, this will probably be the first time you've ever heard this, this thought. But I'll clip it and I'll throw it out there and we'll come back. And it is uh, it's something I've been thinking about and I think it's where we're headed. I've said breaking, I've compared it to a slot machine, right? And I've said that breaking, what companies that produce product want to do is they want to get breaking to a point where it is almost like that slot machine, where someone is putting their money in to buy the break, they're getting their cards out, and they are able to liquidate those cards as quickly as possible in order to put that money back in the machine. So the difference has always been with a slot machine it's automatic. You're playing for the same coins you're putting in, credits, right? You're putting 100 credits in, and at the end of a run, you play down whatever it is, you got 60 back. Same blackjack, right? Okay, I played a shoe. I started with 500 bucks. I have 435. Let's roll it back over and play another shoe. Same thing. Slot machine. Put money in. I'm continuing. I want to be up. I want to be down. You name it. 
it's easier to put the money back in each time. It's easier to just keep playing on credits. I got 20 back. I'm going to bet it. But cards, not so much for two reasons. Number one, you're getting cards out, not coins. And those cards are, one, it's uncertain what the value of that card is, right? Because we can all say, oh, that card you got is worth 10 bucks. That card you got, it's worth 15 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks. You still have to go and sell it and get whatever it sells for on the day you sell it, which is not a fixed amount. So the two issues are the value is uncertain and two, the amount of time it takes for you to actually get that cash out of the machine. So it's very different than a slot machine. It's very different than I'm going to put a hundred bucks in and I know when I'm done with this, you know, this break, I know what I've got back out. That hundred bucks turned into 120, that hundred bucks turned into 60 and I can roll it right back in and keep the machine going and keep going. You can't really do it with breaking because of that delay and uncertainty. Okay. So breaking for it to continue to grow and be almost seamless, frictionless, has to solve for two things. The uncertainty of pricing and the delay in getting that money back so that the person can put it right back into the machine. Previously, my thought was sort of um, like a, a loan type of thing, right? Where your breaker would take your cards, they do a quick analysis and say, okay, those cards are worth you know 500 bucks. And they'll credit you half of it to continue to break with. Um, and that still may be the case. But I have another thought now. Bounties. We're seeing them start to become more mainstream. And we saw it with the Drew Jones. Not only does it drive interest, and we saw it with obviously the, the Magic the Gathering one ring card. Not only does it drive interest in the product itself, so people rip it going after that main, main prize. I would say the Magic the Gathering is sort of like the jackpot prize that you see on top of the slot machine. You saw the Drew Jones, same thing. I think there's a uh, $200,000 David Adams bounty on the uh, the Babe Ruth, the, you know, the first Bowman. I believe what's going to happen is that we're going to be in a universe where specific breakers are given a bounty list for a set number of cards in each, pro in each product. Almost like, if you were to think about this and how it's sort of being done, almost like the buybacks for the MVPs. 20 bucks for the Aaron Judge, 20 bucks for the Goldschmidt, 40 bucks for a refractor, you know, more money for the numbered versions out of up to 99, more for even the ones under 99. I think that each release, Fanatics, Panini, whoever it is that's doing it, will budget into marketing for that product buybacks. But the buybacks will be part and parcel with each of their breakers. So, so follow me through with this, right? It's just my idea. I don't know that this is happening, but Fanatics, Panini, feel free to steal this. We'll check the regulations on it first to see whether or not it can be done. But since there's already bounties out there, and since there's already buybacks out there, and they're both being done, this seems to be the next progression. What if on every release, you had a buyback list? Sort of like when you walk up to a slot machine in a casino, and you see the payouts. Three sevens is worth this. If the sevens are all the same color, it's worth this. If the sevens are mixed colors, worth the three bars, three bells, three cherries, worth this, this, this. What if there was a payout list for the release? All right, you get these five guys in base, they're worth two bucks. You get these five guys in this, they're worth that. They're worth blah, blah, blah. You get these five rookies in number 99 or less, it's worth this. A gold is this. We already see breakers starting to do this, almost like bounties, but... I think that if we're working in a system where – let's just use Fanatics as an – use Panini. It's fine. It doesn't matter, right? It's just an idea. Let's say Panini has their breakers, all right, a specific Panini breaker, 10 breakers, and they roll out to those 10 breakers, the Panini product of the month. Here's the list of 100 cards, a refractor, a base. This is what they're worth, and it's almost like a sell sheet. 
And now when that breaker, when those 10 breakers are doing their breaks, the people who are entering the breaks already know ahead of time what that card is worth when they pull it. And the breaker takes it and gives them credit right to their account on the breaking website, on their breaking account. Here you go. You pulled that. There's 20 bucks. Here's 50 bucks. And you have it. It's ready. It's breaking. It's back in there. Breakers will be thrilled because it's money on their breaking account to spend. Just like the hobby shops are thrilled with the buybacks because people are going in and just buying more cards using the money that's being thrown back into the system. This is my idea. I have come up with it. Don't let anybody steal it as theirs. If you're going to plan on stealing it now and passing it off at your own, Cage Lawyer needs credit for this. Um, we will go back and mark it off so that this is, boom, my idea. Anyway, I don't know whether or not this is what the way it goes, but I've been doing a lot of thinking on it, and I think breaking is where we are going to see more people come in. We're already seeing a lot more people come in and do it. We're already seeing a lot of um, money being put to breaking. We're seeing platforms being developed. We're seeing, um, you know, basically lives from Fanatics to eBay to whatnot to, you know, everybody has Car Shop Live. Um, everybody has, um, you know, a platform on it. People are breaking. I think this is unless I'm an idiot here, guys, and please, you have no hesitancy calling me an idiot, throw it in the chats or send me a DM at Cage Lawyer or The Hobby with Cage on IG. Poke some holes in this. But unless I'm completely off, I believe this solves for the two variables that are the problem, the uncertainty and value. At least for that list of 100 or 200, whatever it is, you know what it's worth. You know what the buyback is. You know this card is worth this. This card is worth that. And not only uncertainty, but the delay in time in getting it to a consigner or selling it or doing it because the breaker is going to take the card right from you and credit your account with that money. Boom, 20 bucks for you know the Shohei rookie. I mean, the Shohei uh, base card. 40 bucks for the Shohei refractor. 20 bucks for the Acuna. I'm using the MVP buyback as the example here, guys. But you understand the point, right? And I think that brings it closer to this machine that I think the manufacturers want it to be and that the breakers are going to want it to be and the ease of use for somebody who comes in. A new person coming in, it's very easy to put that coin or that credit into a slot machine. You know what's happening. But 100 bucks in, boom, I'm getting this out. Hell, people play penny machines, put the money in. They don't even know what they're looking for. It's just you tell me what's coming out. Okay, that was worth this much. You're able to do that with this. And I think that's where we're headed. I know collectors are listening to this and cringing because from the collector's side, I think that it's, um, you know, people want cards. People want end users to want their cards. That's not what we have right now. That's not where, the, you know, the market is growing. There will be collector-based products where this does not have to be the case for. People will buy those higher-end products. People will buy the other products. Um, but I think that this is, you know, this is one half of the coin. The collector side is the other half. And I think that if we get more people in, more money is being made, it allows the companies to be more innovative with the collector cards that you actually do want to collect. Um, and I understand the flip side to this is if you turn it into a casino, it's really no longer that commodity. It's really no longer that, that card that somebody wants. Instead, they're opening cards to try to make money on opening the cards. No one actually wants the card. No one wants to be an end user. So the, the cards themselves, what kind of value do they have? Um, I think I've heard enough content out there talking about the junk slab era, the junk wax era, the junk, 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 junk. There'll be plenty of cards made during this era that will have value. It's probably not the ones that will be involved in this type of a setup that I've just come up with. Anyway, we went all over the place on this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. About a half an hour. I try to keep them short. Again, Garrett Wilson tonight. Raiders want to know. Fanatics. Panini, if you like my suggestion, you want to use it, you want to, you know, break me off a little something for coming up with the idea, that's great. If not, I'm the idea man, you know? I mean, if somebody listened to my almost 1,200 episodes, there were some pretty good ideas in there. I love each and every one of you who has stayed until the end here, almost a half an hour. I love you if you didn't stay till the end, too. I love everybody who lets me come out and do this content. Anybody who's within an earshot of this, who hears this or watches this, thank you. Um, you allowed me to escape um, but otherwise for me is not a great day here on 9-11. 
Um, and you know, any other day where work is stressful or crazy or life just gets you to be able to have this escape and come and chat with you guys. It's a real blessing. And I thank you guys for that. Take care. See you soon.